This videotape contains two programs from the public television series Travels in Europe with Rick Steves. The 13 shows of the series have been arranged geographically into five home videos. Stay tuned following the last program on this tape for information on how to order videos in the series, books by Rick Steves, and several travel accessories. This series is funded in part by CD.com, a Seattle-based company offering a digital alternative to microfiche, an efficient and effective way to protect both your data and the environment. Raise your travel dreams to their upright and locked positions. Join us now as we discover the ins and outs of travels in Europe. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Can you have some? That's good. Buongiorno. I'm Rick Steves, inviting you to travel with us as we continue to explore the best of both offbeat and well-known Europe. Mangiare, mangiare, mangiare. This time we visit northern Italy's Lombardy region, nestled against Switzerland at the base of the Alps. We start in bustling Milan, and then travel to Lake Como, settling down in the village of Varena. We'll climb from chic, busy streets to Gothic spires, We'll visit a one-of-a-kind opera museum, see a Michelangelo, go window shopping, and walk around a mighty city. Then we'll retreat by ferry to the perfect village on an irresistible lake. We'll learn a bit about Italy's past and present. See how to get around in Milan and have high cuisine in a youth hostel. Oh, but what about her? Oh, Milan is Italy's city of today. Not travel poster Italy, but trend-setting, designer serious, industrial powerhouse, new Italy. In the last few years, Italy has surpassed England in per capita income. And that's not because of tourism and ancient ruins. While many tourists come to Italy for the past, no Italian trip is complete without seeing Milan. The economic success of modern Italy can be blamed on this city. They say that for every church in Rome, there's a bank in Milan. A city of two million mostly hardworking, fashion conscious, time is money people. Milan is Italy's industrial, banking, television, publishing, and convention capital. Milan is a melting pot of people and history. A mix of Germanic Lombards who settled here 1400 years ago, Austrians who ruled off and on for centuries, and the original Italians. The city is mostly concrete and cars. While the parks are shaggy, the buildings are beautifully manicured. As if to make up for its concrete shell, the windows and the people are works of art today's art. Milan is an international fashion capital. Even the cheese comes gift-wrapped. 
but Milan isn't big on the tourist circuit. Here, culture often means experimental films, innovative theater, decorative arts, and chic lines in fashion. The new height is this one. It's the bag with the, a box for joy. A box for jewelry. Hmm. Milan's design world includes a business community with a social conscience. This disco party is the finale of a popular project that raises lots of money to fight AIDS. Every two years, Milan's fashion and design community organizes a huge exhibition of their design work to help in the fight. Tonight's party celebrates their success. But Milan doesn't have to be more expensive than other Italian cities. It's better organized than most, and there's plenty to see. Like many of the major churches in Southern Europe, the Duomo, or cathedral, has a dress code. No shorts or bare shoulders. Milan's cathedral is the city's centerpiece. It's the third largest church in Europe, after the Vatican and Seville. There are 52 pillars, each 150 feet tall and over 2,000 statues, and room to seat 12,000 worshipers. The stained glass windows are among the world's largest. Built from 1386 until 1810, the cathedral started as Gothic and was finished under Napoleon. What it lacks in architectural harmony, it makes up for in sheer size. Two laps and you've done your daily walk. An elevator whisks visitors to the rooftop. Gothic architecture evolved until it reached a final, overripe stage. This is a textbook example of that chapter. Flamboyant Gothic, spires upon spires. This is decoration nearly to the obliteration of form. The Virgin Mary stands 300 feet above the ground. On clear days, you can see the Swiss Alps. And from here stretches the Piazza Duomo, or Cathedral Square. It's a classic big city scene. Professionals scurry, kids chase pigeons, merchants hang out, and visitors snap photos. <laughs> Italy treats its shoppers well. How about this for a model? The Victor Emmanuel Gallery is a symbol of Milan. Four stories high, it's elegantly decorated from glass dome to inlaid floor. Since it opened, the gallery has been a prime attraction for tourists and locals alike. Sadly, the designer fell from the top to his death in 1878, on the day before the grand opening. Locals have long appreciated the floor's zodiac design. 
For good luck, they step on the testicles of the mosaic torus. For better luck, they give it a spin. Italians enjoy their coffee bars. Once you know the system, it's easy. Sitting at the bar is cheapest. First, pay the cashier for what you want, like cappuccino or espresso. Then give the receipt to the bartender with your request and wait at the bar for your drink. Tipping is unnecessary, but at a table, it's good style to leave a few coins. I'm paying triple price for this cup of coffee just to sit at a full service table. For me, it's a bargain, a prime seat for some of Europe's best people watching. Milan's story goes way back. Before Christ, the Romans called this region Mediolanum, or the central place. By the fourth century AD, it was the capital of the western half of the Roman Empire. It was from Milan that the Emperor Constantine made Christianity legal when he issued the Edict of Milan. Medieval Milan grew in importance until by the time of the Renaissance, it was called the New Athens. For a while, even Leonardo da Vinci lived here. Then, for 400 years, Milan was ruled by Spain, France, and Austria. Not surprisingly, a revolutionary spirit was building. In 1848, the city helped lead a revolution against Austria. And then Milan became crucial in Italy's battle for unification. Parceled out among the major European empires, no one wanted to see Italy united. But step by step, Italy went from a pile of colonies in 1850 to one united country in 1870. Italy's heroic battle was led by patriots whose names mark the great squares and streets of Italian cities today. Mazzini, Garibaldi, Cavour, and the first Italian king, Victor Emmanuel. Victor Emmanuel was the king of a little Italian state called Piedmont, the only Italian-blooded king around, and a natural to be the first king of a newly united Italy. An unlikely hero of the 1860s quest for independence was Giuseppe Verdi, the great Italian composer of operas. He was a symbol of the movement towards Italian unification. His arias served as virtual national anthems during years when flying the Italian flag could land you in jail. To Italian patriots, his name, Verdi, stood for Victor Emmanuel, Roy d'Italia, King of Italy. The best place in town to hear a Verdi aria is at Milan's La Scala Theatre, possibly the world's most prestigious opera house. It opened in 1778 with an opera by Antonio Salieri. While tickets are hard to get and expensive, anyone can peek at the theatre from the museum. Opera buffs will love this collection. Verdi's top hat, Rosini's eyeglasses, Toscanini's batons. Everything from original scores to memorabilia of great composers and musicians.
Today, it's hard to believe that World War II bombings left Milan in shambles. The post-war Pirelli Tower was a trendsetter in the 50s and remains one of the tallest buildings in Europe. I just picked up our train tickets for tomorrow's ride to Lake Como. Rather than wrestle with a big train station, it's much easier from a travel agency. Now, I'll reconfirm our hotel reservations. These phone cards are handy. Io sono Rick Steves, a journalist con America. You can buy them throughout Italy at tobacco shops. Reservation settled. Now we can relax. Time for lunch. You'll find delightful eateries all over town. This is a fast food city, but fast food in a fashion capital ain't a burger and fries. The bars, delis, rusticeria, and self-services cater to people with plenty of taste and more money than time. And in many bars, fine and free munchies appear late in the afternoon. And an expensive beer can become, if you're discreet, a light meal. A popular way here to eat well at a good price is to drop by a rusticeria and buy a meal of restaurant quality food at near grocery store prices. We'll enjoy our takeout lunch on the lawn at our next destination. <laughs> the immense Sforza Castle, named after the immense Sforza family, Milan's answer to the Medici, is exhausting at first sight. But its free museum is filled with medieval armor, furniture, and art. And best of all, Michelangelo's Rondanini Pieta is here. He died before finishing this work. Its elongated form anticipated the mannerist style of art that was to come. A rare opportunity to see a Michelangelo statue and no crowds. We're off to see one more important sight before we leave Milan. In the church of Santa Maria della Grazia is Leonardo's Last Supper. Shortly after its completion, it became clear Leonardo's experimental fresco technique didn't work. The scaffolding has been up for years. The church was bombed in World War II, but almost miraculously, the Last Supper survived. In the Renaissance masterpiece, Leonardo captures the moment when Jesus says to his disciples, one of you will betray me. Each of the 12 wonders, Lord, is it I. We've enjoyed the Hotel Spironare. It's a friendly one-star place, two blocks from the cathedral. I always confirm the complete price before we move in. So in paying up, there's no confusion. Milan's three-line subway system is one of the snappiest and easiest in Europe. Big cities shrink when you master their subways. In any big European city, the train station is usually an easy subway ride away. Milan Central Station was built under Mussolini. Mussolini left a heavy fascist mark on the city's architecture. Trains to Lake Como depart hourly. We want departures and that's not a Revo. Here we go, Como, track six in seven minutes. Packing light is particularly important for train travelers. In an hour, we'll be in a whole different world, Italy's northern lakes. North Italy is splattered with lakes, offering a cool, scenic, and romantic break. Lago Maggiore, Lago di Garda, Lago di Como. For the best mix of accessibility, scenery, offbeatness, aristocratic old days romance, and a complete dose of Italian lakes wonder, my choice is Lake Como. Lined with 19th century villas, surrounded by mountains, 
buzzing with ferries, hydrofoils, and little passenger ships. This is a good place to take a break from the sightseeing obligations and turnstile culture of central Italy. Next to the village of Como, the elegant Villa d'Esti first opened its doors as a hotel over a hundred years ago. It was built in the 16th century for the prestigious Gallio family. Royalty, celebrities, and first-class travelers flocked to the villa to get away from it all. Luxury travelers still retreat here for a peaceful lunch or an old-world weekend getaway. Whether first class or budget, it seems half the travelers you'll meet on Lake Como have tossed their itinerary into the lake and are actually relaxing. Today, the lake's only serious industry is tourism. Thousands of lakeside residents travel daily to nearby Lugano in Switzerland to find work. As is so often the case with backdoor places, Lake Como's charm is rooted in economic misfortune. The area's isolation and flat economy have left it pretty much the way 19th century romantic artists remembered it. Varena. There's our hotel, the Albergo Milano. Albergo Milano. How about Albergo opposite of Milano? There's nothing like a small town break, ideally, with a view of the lake. This is the kind of place I like to list in my guidebooks. Family run, simple, but comfortable. Thank you. You get a short answer. I speak a little of English. I, I help my mother in some activities. I think this town is the best of all lake worlds. On the less driven side of the lake, Varena has a promenade and a tiny harbor. It has a pint-sized train station with direct connections to Milan. Transportation on the lakes can be romantic or lively. These ferries are handy and fun. With their help, we're going to do more village hopping. After a stop at Bellagio, we'll tour a villa at Cadnabia. And in Managgio, we'll meet the couple who run the youth hostel. They're famous for their cooking, so we'll be dropping in at about dinner time. Our first stop, Bellagio, calls itself the Pearl of the Lake. A classy combination of tidiness and old world elegance, it's a fine place to surround yourself with the more adventurous of the posh travelers and shop for umbrellas and ties. Uh -huh. The heavy curtains between the arcades keep the visitors and their poodles from sweating. Punta Spartivento, literally the point that divides the wind, is a short stroll from Bellagio, relaxed as a Renoir painting. From here, you can ponder the place where hot and muggy Italy is welded to the Alps. Next stop, Cadenabia, to visit my favorite of Lake Como's famed villas, Villa Carlotta. It's not a hotel, but a museum. It offers an elegant neoclassical interior and famous statues by Canova. spring especially, the garden is the reason to visit.
Menaggio is a great stop if you're looking for a bargain bed or the cheapest gourmet meal on the lake. Italy is not known for its hostels, but Ostello La Primula is one of Europe's best. Family run for 10 years, it caters to a quiet, savor the lakes crowd. Ty and Paola run a cooking school, and the meals that come out of this kitchen are delicioso. Tonight's menu includes pasta with cauliflower, stuffed eggplant, tomatoes, and a strawberry tart. Travel stories are passed with the bread and wine. Mark is on a pilgrimage from Holland, walking to Assisi. Um, so you don't take trains, you just walk. You just walk. <laughs> we traded tips on the best gelato in Florence and how to catch the lift up the mountain with a bike to coast three hours back down here for dinner. A perfect finale for our look at the best of northern Italy. Join us next time as we swing through the urban jungle of Naples, drive the treacherous Amalfi Coast, find the pomp in Pompeii, and ponder ancient Greek wonders at Paestum. I'm Rick Steves. Happy travels. Ciao. Raise your travel dreams to their upright and locked positions. Join us now as we discover the ins and outs of travels in Europe. Buongiorno, I'm Rick Steves, delighted to be taking time off from writing my guidebooks to travel with you through my favorite corners of Europe. We're in Italy now, just coming into Naples. We took the overnight train from Milan. From Naples, we'll hop a commuter train to Sorrento, which will be our home base for side trips to Pompeii, the Amalfi Coast, and to Paestum. After surviving the Vespa slalom called Naples, we'll escape into a different world. The ruins of Pompeii, the resort of Sorrento, the stunning Amalfi Coast. And the magnificent Greek temple at Paestum. If you like Italy as far south as Rome, go further south, it gets better. If Italy's getting on your nerves, think twice about going further. Italy intensifies as you plunge deeper.
Naples is Italy in the extreme. It's best, the birthplace of pizza and Sophia Loren, and it's worst, the home of mafia-style organized crime. Any way you look at it, the puzzle of Italy is incomplete without Naples. It's Italy's third largest city with over two million people. Napoli, as it's called, has few open spaces or parks. It becomes evident quickly that this is Europe's most densely populated city. It also remains southern Italy's leading city, offering a fascinating collection of museums, churches, eclectic architecture, and colorful workaday neighborhoods. Naples is a festival of life in the streets, hotter and more crowded than ever, a tangled mess that still somehow manages to breathe, laugh, and sing with a captivating Italian accent. Many people come to southern Italy to see the ruined Roman city of Pompeii. Naples National Museum of Archaeology offers the best peek possible into the artistic jewelry boxes of that doomed community. Most of the treasures of Pompeii ended up here, like these mosaics. We'll visit Pompeii later. This gallery of Pompeian paintings, statues, and mosaics clearly inspired the Renaissance greats. Besides works from Pompeii, the museum holds an impressive collection of other Greek and Roman statues. Its highlight is the Farnese collection, a group of huge, bright, and wonderfully restored statues excavated from the Baths of Caracalla in Rome. You can almost hear the Toro Farnese snorting. This is the largest intact statue of antiquity. It was carved out of one piece of marble and restored by Michelangelo. The museum's entire collection is thoughtfully explained in English. Rather than seeing Naples as a list of sites, I like to stop at its one great museum and then just walk through the core of the city, a sure way to capture its essence. Naples is a living medieval city. It's its own best site. You'll see more fights and smiles per cobble here than anywhere else in Italy. Wander, but wander carefully. In Naples, drivers consider red lights discretionary and mopeds can mow you down from any place at any time. Poor old Dante. What would the philosopher think of the chaos of today's Naples? Now we've reached Naples' Spanish Quarter. That name must go back to the days when this area was ruled by Spain. In the last 10 minutes, we've been warned five times. Watch your camera. <laughs> Unlikely as it may look, the Spanish Quarter is still a home to organized crime. Two, ah, there we go. Two edge. Ricardo. <laughs> The earthquake of 1980 left many of the buildings structurally unsound. Some cross-street braces still keep these vertical neighborhoods from falling into each other. The only thing predictable about this Neapolitan tide pool is the ancient grid plan of the streets, the friendliness of its shopkeepers, and the boldness of its Vespas. The classy shopping malls of a hundred years ago provide a handy break before the last half of our Naples walk. <laughs> would, you, would you like one of these pastries? This is a, uh, la numero uno di Napoli. Sfogliatella. Do it ancora. Sfogliatella. A pastry Naples loves most. Okay, shall we go?
Avanti. This small chapel is a Baroque explosion mourning the body of Christ, laid out on a soft pillow under a veil carved out of marble. It's like no statue I've seen. Giuseppe Sammartino carved it 250 years ago. Other statues, carved from a single piece of marble, adorn the altar. That's despair, struggling with a rope net made of marble. Naples has the most intact ancient Roman street plan of any city. It's easy to picture life here as it was in Roman times, with shop fronts that close up to form private homes after dark. Today is just one more page in a 2,000-year-old story of city activity. You name it, it occurs on the streets of Naples today, as it always has. For a tasty and typically Neapolitan finale, here's pure pizza in its birthplace. For over a hundred years, Antica Pizzeria Michele has served Neapolitans pizza. <laughs> Just the right combination of fresh dough, tomatoes, and mozzarella in traditional wood-burning ovens. This place serves only two kinds of pizza. I'm having margarita, tomato sauce, and mozzarella. The other choice is marinara, tomato sauce, oregano, and garlic with no cheese. Naples is a thrill to explore, but a day's about enough for me. We're sleeping an hour south in the resort town of Sorrento. Sorrento is an attractive resort of 25,000 residents and easily as many tourists. It's wedged peacefully on a ledge under the mountains, over the Mediterranean, and surrounded by lemon trees and olive groves. Our hotel, the Lorelei, offers just what we're looking for. A relaxing Mediterranean view, an elevator down to the beach, a train station nearby for easy side tripping, well-worn pastel ambience, and not a hint of Naples.
Sorrento is just 20 miles from Naples, and it's surrounded by great sites. In the shadow of Mount Vesuvius, you've got the ancient dig of Pompeii. Just off the coastline, we've got the romantic island of Capri, and around the corner, the exotic Amalfi Coast. A few miles away, the ancient Greek site of Paestum. Sorrento is a natural home base for day trips, and today we'll visit Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii. If you're eager to peek inside Europe's only active volcano, a shuttle will drive you close to the top of Mount Vesuvius. Then it's a 30-minute hike to the lip of the crater and waiting there at 4,000 feet are desolate lunar-like surroundings, a commanding view, and hot rocks. In 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted and Pompeii was stopped in its tracks, buried under a 30-foot wave of hot mud and volcanic ash. Imagine the horror. In these amazing casts, you can almost see the expression on the victim's face the moment they were hit. The first excavation began in 1748. For archaeologists, its rediscovery was a windfall, teaching them much about ancient Roman culture. Once a thriving commercial port of 20,000 people, Pompeii grew out of Greek and Etruscan roots into an important Roman city. Today, these well-preserved ruins of the ancient city of Pompeii offer the best look anywhere at what life in the Roman Empire must have been like 2,000 years ago. You can almost hear the echoes of everyday life in Pompeii. Pompeii's Forum was the city's commercial, religious, and political center. Probably the most ruined part of Pompeii, this area is still the most impressive. Visitors can stroll through several temples and the basilica. The basilica was Pompeii's largest building and was used for legal and commercial business. Much later, in the 4th century, this style of building was adopted by the newly legal Christian religion. It became the standard floor plan for the churches, or basilicas, of medieval Europe. Inside the home, you get a feel for at least the rich man's everyday Roman life, with remnants of frescoes, paintings, and mosaics. This mosaic, now at the National Museum in Naples, once adorned the floor of the House of the Fawn. It depicts how the Macedonians under Alexander the Great defeated Persia. The 18th century excavations of this site helped fuel the neoclassical trend that swept Europe a generation after the dig. Images of Pompeian culture reappeared in Napoleon's France. The most popular Parisian women's hairdo was inspired by art from here. Stepping stones allowed pedestrians to cross during rainstorms. The Stabian baths are the best preserved in the city. You can see the swimming pool, the frigidarium, Tepidarium and Caldarium. The Jacuzzi Darium didn't come till much later. What a grand parting shot of Pompeii. This amphitheater was built 80 years before Christ. It's the oldest and best preserved Roman amphitheater in Italy. Well, it seems we missed the gladiator battles, but let's not miss the train back to Sorrento. Sorrento welcomes visitors.
the language barrier is no problem. As in most of Europe, any place interested in a tourist's money will explain how to spend it in whatever language is necessary. English always makes it. And many of Sorrento's so-called tourist offices are actually travel agencies. You trust them for information, and they sell you a tour to the island of Capri. In Sorrento, when you want accurate information, find the Public Tourist Information Center. Here, there is the connection by uh, boat, hydrofall, train, and bus for visit the historical center. And there is also the new big map of Sorrento and Sant'Agnello. We are here. For you. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. If you buy a ticket to Capri, it's a pleasant crossing. We come to Capri this way, here. Capri is a pretty island in the sun and an easy day trip from Sorrento. Much less touristy, Sorrento has a pleasant and unspoiled old quarter. How many generations have played cards on this portico? Sorrento has a lively main shopping street. And there's great people watching at the evening passeggiata along the main drag. This tradition is Italy's answer to Spain's paseo. It's like cruising without cars. There are lots of reasonable restaurants in this town, but our hotel restaurant has an unbeatable view for the price. So we'll keep it simple, eat here, and have an early night. Tomorrow, we have another big side trip. If you're in Europe and vacation time is tight, and the goal is to meander through Greek ruins, why rush off to Greece when you have southern Italy? After all, 500 years before Christ, this part of Italy was a Greek colony called Magna Graecia. One of the best Greek temples anywhere is in Italy, here at Paestum, just south of Naples and Sorrento. Founded as the city of Poseidon in the 6th century BC, this was a key stop on an important trade route. The Romans took it over in the 3rd century BC and changed the name to Paestum. Then the next conquerors, malaria-carrying mosquitoes, kept the place wonderfully desolate for nearly a thousand years. Paestum was rediscovered in the 18th century and today offers European travelers a relatively quick and easy look at some impressive Greek ruins. This mistakenly named Temple of Neptune is actually dedicated to Hera. Just imagine this temple decorated with colorfully painted statues and rich marble. Better preserved than the Parthenon in Athens, this huge structure is a tribute to Greek engineering and aesthetics. Constructed in 450 BC, it's a textbook example of the Doric style. The word Renaissance means rebirth of this grand Greek style of architecture. Greek architects were masters at overcoming illusions. For instance, even back then, architects knew that a long flat baseline appears to sag. To overcome this, they bent it up just a little. And since parallel columns appear to fall away from each other, these tilt in. These techniques were used on many Greek buildings. For natural grandeur, try this harrowing Amalfi Coast Road, just minutes from Sorrento. It's a scenic route winding around breathtaking cliffs. Talk about impressive engineering. One of the world's great rides.
you gain respect for the Italian engineers who built this road, and even more respect for the bus drivers who drive it. The Amalfi Coast towns are pretty to look at, but generally overpriced, overcrowded, and a long hike above tiny beaches. It's true, beautiful sandy coves tease from far below, and picturesque hotels and villas cling expertly to the hilly terrain. But in the summer, the coastal road is so congested that traffic is regulated. Locals are allowed to drive only every other day. Odd numbered license plates one day, even numbers the next. Buses and tourist cars are allowed to struggle on any day. For me, the top Amalfi thrills are scenic. Enjoyed best from a local bus. Jing Jing. Jing Jing. Yeah. Allah Sante. If you meet the people, <laughs> you might find yourself in a lemon grove paradise. This is a lemon liqueur with the lemon and the tiscos. Wow, that's good. Our new Amalfi friend invited us to climb the steep hillside to his family's lemon tree shaded villa. You're in good shape. But don't begin until we come back. Salute. Salute. Oh, wow. Bella. There's our final vista for this half hour. The town of Positano, 20 minutes from Sorrento. It sits on the most spectacular stretch of the coast. Positano is a pleasant and expensive gathering of cafes, boutiques, and women's clothing stores. If you're not into shopping, stroll the Bogan via shaded streets or kick back on the steps of the village square. <laughs> Italian street musicians. Well, not exactly. Relaxing and having fun, what matters most on the Amalfi Coast. The beach is superb. Specializing in scenery and sand, this beauty spot calls for fun in the Mediterranean sun and recharging our solar batteries. Thanks for traveling with us. Join us next time in Greece for island hopping, ancient wonders, whitewashed towns, and more sunshine. I'm Rick Steves, wishing you happy travels. Ciao. Home videos of destinations in this series are available for $24.95. To order the 60-minute, two-program tape on Milan and Naples, or any other destination tape, call 1-800-866-7425. Also available, Rick's new 500-page Best of Europe guidebook for $16.95. To order, please have your credit card ready and call 1-800-866-7425.
This program was funded in part by CD.com, a Seattle-based company offering a digital alternative to microfiche, an efficient and effective way to protect both your data and the environment.